thank you very much. And uh, this should be a very interesting panel discussion on the broader political and security issues uh, in the Horn of Africa that are related to uh, food security. As we all know, and as we've talked about already, the Horn of Africa is one of the most food insecure regions in the world. Roughly half the region's population lives in areas that face extreme food shortages on a regular basis. Food security issues affect every country in the Horn of Africa. And if you uh, look at, as someone mentioned, the El Nino reports coming up and look at any of the other meteorological sites, it looks like 2012 is not going to be much better than 2011. So things are probably going to get worse in terms of food security and the Horn uh, before it gets better. Uh, political development and security issues are intertwined with food insecurity. Instability and food insecurity reinforce each other, often fostering instability and threats to national sovereignty, undermining local resiliency and coping mechanisms, and generally uh, generating internally displaced persons, refugees, and often, unfortunately, human rights violations. So all of these issues are intertwined together throughout the Horn of Africa. Uh, we have an interesting panel who have with long experience in Africa, and you have your, the, their bios before you, so I won't go through that, but uh, we have representatives from the State Department, from USAID, from the Defense Department, and David Chin from a long experience in state and with GW University, and if you don't read David's blog on the Horn of Africa, you're missing a really important uh, uh, source of information. So what we'll do is in the order we'll sitting, we'll ask each person to make some uh, brief introductory comments. I'll ask the first question, that's my privilege to be here, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, uh, Richard, please. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back at NDU. Uh, have a robust NDU breakfast to start off the morning, uh, as I recall from my days here. I'd like to especially thank Lynn Wells for organizing this and Vice Admiral Rondo for hosting it. Uh, amazing that so many people can come out so early in the morning for this the Horn of Africa, but thank you all for coming. Uh, the State Department and USAID began to receive reporting from the field in late 2010, and through the FUSENET system that we had helped put in place, we came to understand that a large drought, large scale drought in the horn might be on the horizon. This was uh, around November of 2010. And as we received further concrete confirmation of this during the first half of 2011, Assistant Secretary Carson engaged the highest levels of the State Department to alert them to the humanitarian, political, and security implications that a massive drought and migration of people might have on the region. At the direction of the Secretary of State, the Horn of Africa Working Group was established in June of 2011. And this task force, which I had the privilege of heading, was staffed by state and USA and included the participation of our missions in New York, Rome, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Turkey, and Mexico to a very large group of international donors. Uh, I mentioned this to give you a sense of the, the scope of the interagency nature of the U.S. government's response to this crisis. The task force objectives early on were to identify outstanding policy issues, assess the nature and extent of the crisis, frame the narrative of the situation in a manner that would maximize contributions from donors, and ensure that the flow of information and interagency coordination was optimized. I believe that we were very effective in achieving these objectives. Along the way, we were fortunate to have the active involvement of Secretary Clinton, key members of the White House, and USAID Administrator Rajiv Shah, who you'll hear about later today, uh, as well as uh, members of the Hill, uh, particularly staff members who kept the members very well informed. As you know, resources are always critical when it comes to meeting uh, crises. Uh, as we came to have a better grip on the emergency situation, although not perfect by any means, we began to plan for the next phase of improving resiliency. So as we were trying to meet the immediate emergency needs, we were already beginning to look at how to prevent such a crisis from occurring in the future. 
Uh, this resiliency, uh, for which we're going to be uh, holding a conference uh, later this month uh, in Nairobi, hosted by USA, involving a very, very, very large number of members of the international donor community, uh, has as some of its goals to make provision for refugees to return to their homes. Uh, what sorts of things we could have put in place to prevent crises like this in the future, and, or at a minimum, at least mitigate the most severe aspects of this type. We are proud that throughout the crisis, we, the United States, have remained the largest single donor of humanitarian relief in the heart of Africa, contributing more than $934 million in assistance thus far uh, since the beginning of 2011 and acting as a credible catalyst to encourage similar engagement by numerous countries, organizations, and partners. I'm pleased to note that the famine in Somalia has ended, due primarily to the recent exceptional harvest and the effective delivery of significant humanitarian assistance. But let me also be very clear, Somalia is not out of the woods yet, as most of you know. The situation is extremely fragile, and requires continued assistance and increased access to Southern Somalia to prevent a backslide. I'm certain my colleagues from USA Garage will elaborate on the scope of the food security crisis itself and the various challenges posed, as well as additional aspects of the ongoing US government response. Somalia and some of the areas immediately adjacent to Somalia present one of the most difficult operating environments imaginable for both humanitarian and governance objectives. This in turn has policy implications for our broader interests in the Horn, some of which uh, were very, very well explained by General Ham. The African Bureau has devoted a great deal of effort to encourage democracy, rule of law, good governance, and the establishment of the institutions that are critical to democracy. We believe that this is essential for achieving our other objectives of economic growth, enhanced health outcomes, conflict mitigation and or resolution, and cooperation on a whole series of transnational issues, some of which General Ham underlined today. Making progress on any of these worthy goals became even more threatened by the humanitarian crisis brought on by the drought and subsequent famine. In the short term, we had to shift our focus to providing adequate relief that we hope would result in sufficient stabilization to allow us to return to our midterm objectives in the Horn. The exodus of large numbers of refugees from Somalia into Kenya, Ethiopia, and Djibouti added an atmosphere of crisis to an already difficult refugee situation that existed in each of these countries. At the same time, the situation applied even greater pressure on the Somali transitional federal government, the TFG, to demonstrate that it remained politically relevant to a population for which it had not yet been able to provide any semblance of government. The population in central and southern Somalia remained largely under the control of al-Shabaab, which adopted a sometimes very hostile posture toward external humanitarian aid and prevented Somalis from migrating to Mogadishu and border towns to seek refuge. Attacks continued and still continue against the TFG, the African Union peacekeeping force known as AMISOM, as well as other entities that El Shabaab perceives as a threat to its radical ideologies. We found that the humanitarian crisis highlighted and exacerbated, in some cases, the trends that we knew existed. El Shabaab continued its efforts to impose its ideology through repression and harsh violence at times across international borders, and the TFG was further exposed as a very weak governing authority with very limited capability. The large majority of inhabitants in the Horn of Africa affected by the drought happened to be in Ethiopia and Kenya, not Somalia. But the epicenter of the current drought and the emergency character were and continue to remain in Somalia parts of which the UN declared to be in famine in July of 2011. Given the lack of effective central government able to address the needs of its own citizens, what some have come, come to define as a failed state, it is no surprise that this has given rise to transnational security problems, 
Pirates are able to seek and find safe haven in the ungoverned spaces of Somalia. Terrorists are able to train, plan, and launch operations from within Somalia. And El Shabaab is able to exert control over large swaths of territory and people. El Shabaab is not just a problem for Somalis, but poses challenges for the Horn of Africa and the international community. While its leadership has recently announced a merger with Al Qaeda, Al Shabaab is not a monolithic organization. Rather, it is a fluid alliance of convenience which has seen recently its hold on some areas in southern Somalia wane. Most, but not all, Shabaab fighters are youths and elderly men. Some of them recruited at gunpoint and possessing little military training. Many more of the recruits have been opportunistically drawn to Al Shabaab from Somalia's many clan and militia factions. Nonetheless, Al Shabaab continues to pose a major transnational threat to security in the Horn and a major challenge to the Kenyan forces which came across the border in mid October of last year. Al Shabaab's role in disrupting and preventing famine relief was a primary source of the migration of populations out of southern Somalia into Mogadishu, Ethiopia, and Kenya. What we see today in the current security humanitarian conditions of the Bob refugee camp in Kenya is a prime example of transnational destabilization. The Bob now houses more than 450,000 refugees, uh, somewhere either the second or third largest city now in all of Kenya and a settlement originally intended for 90,000 people. Humanitarian agencies and the Kenyan government are dealing with high levels of insecurity there and increasing levels of violence. There are reports that the insecurity in Dabab, Dadaab, has gotten so bad that refugees are fleeing the camp in search of safety elsewhere. Last fall in Kenya, the spate of kidnappings of Westerners attributed to Al-Shabaab was beginning to have serious implications for Kenya's tourism industry and ultimately compelled the incursion of Kenyan forces into Somalia. While the United States did not participate in that operation, we have recognized Kenya's right to defend its land and maritime borders against terrorist threats and armed incursions. Al-Shabaab retains a robust capability in many parts of South Central Somalia, but they have been under increasing pressure by the three-pronged military efforts of Amazon, TFG, and allied Somali forces, as well as Ethiopia and Kenya. One of the transnational answers to Al-Shabaab has been Amazon, to which the United States and the international community have provided effective support and training. Amazon's true contributing countries currently are Uganda, Burundi, and Djibouti, and possibly this summer we might see a battalion enter from Sierra Leone. The United States remains committed to seeing the weakening and eventual disappearance of El Shabaab as one of the necessary steps to stabilize the Horn, and a principal reason for our support and that of our international partners to Amazon and the Somali National Security Forces. We supported UN Resolution 2036, which was passed unanimously on February 22nd, and that expanded Amazon peacekeeping mission from about 12,000 to 17,731 troops. That resolution allows for the rehatting of more than 4,000 Kenyan soldiers and calls for them to be placed under, for the first time under an Amazon mandate. The mandate will also be expanded to allow Amazon to work outside Mogadishu and other parts of South Central Somalia. Al Shabaab has been degraded in recent months and they remain under continuing pressure. The recent announcement by al-Shabaab's putative leadership that it has joined al-Qaeda proved at a minimum that it is not acting in the best interests of the Somali people. The State Department hopes that the augmentation of Amazon will contribute substantially to greater stability in Somalia, partially by shrinking the territory and people under al-Shabaab's control, by implementation of the Security Council's ban on imports of Somali charcoal, which we believe will decrease Al Shabaab's revenues, and ideally the end of the threats it poses to in the Horn and elsewhere. This would greatly improve the possibility of bringing governance, economic growth, and a better quality of life to Somalia. The famine, as I mentioned, also tested Somalia's TFG and its capabilities. 
Up until August of last year, which was the height of the food security crisis, the TFG controlled only blocks within Mogadishu. Heavy fighting on the part of Amazon troops led to Shabab's eventual retreat from Mogadishu, and as Amazon scrambled to secure the city, the question arose as to how well the TFG would manage the humanitarian response. The TFG struggled to assert itself effectively as the governing authority of Somalia. Internal divisions and personal agendas often thwarted and continue to thwart progress to control those regions outside of Mogadishu. While recognizing the imperfections and limited capacity of the TFG, the international community is also not interested in seeing an immediate vacuum. We expect that when the current transition phase for the TFG ends in August, that there will be a more effective governing structure put in place. To that end, the State Department supported the September 6 adoption of what's called the Roadmap to end the, this transition in Somalia. And under the UN Special Representative, Mahiga, the TFG, the Regional Administration of Puntland and Gamudu, and the moderate Islamic movement, Ahlu Sunnah Wa Jama'a, ASWJ, completed a political roadmap that addresses critical transitional requirements. This roadmap and subsequent Garaway principles, which delineated the key tasks from the roadmap, call for the establishment of constituent assembly, drafting of a new constitution, selection of a new parliament, and the indirect election of a new president and speaker of parliament by August 20th of this year. This is an ambitious agenda, but one that is led by the Somalis themselves and fully supported by the international community as demonstrated at the February 23 London Conference on Somalia. Our Somali unit in Nairobi interfaces frequently with the signatories of the roadmap and has been wrapping up its visits to Somalia. We are looking for concrete results by August 20, and we believe the London Conference injected a greater sense of urgency into this process. Secretary Clinton, along with the other London Conference participants, made clear that there will be no further extensions of the TFG's mandate after August. Thus, for us, the famine heightened two of the existing challenges we and the international community face in bringing about a longer-term, sustainable, and acceptable solution to the situation in Somalia that is affecting our interests throughout the Horn, especially in Kenya and Ethiopia. Somalia poses one of the largest security concerns in Africa for the United States government, and more importantly, the neighboring states and the broader international community. The absence of a central government for more than 20 years has left the world a broken, impoverished, but, hope, but not hopeless Somalia. Even taking into account the horrible conditions the famine left in its wake and the thousands of lives that have been lost, the past year in Somalia has seen some positive developments and has left the international community with some momentum which we hope will lead to better governance and stabilization. Secretary Clinton said at the London Conference, for decades the world focused on what we can prevent from happening in Somalia, conflict, famine, and terrorism. Now we are focused on what we can build. Thank you very much. Roger. Uh, good morning to everybody and thank you uh, um, for having me here today on this panel. Um, this morning I was sort of uh, debating about uh, the speech uh, a little bit because we have Administrator uh, Rajiv Shah as your keynote speaker for lunch and we have Nancy Lindbergh who's the head of our humanitarian assistance on a panel this afternoon. So I thought perhaps to give us more time for a little bit of discussion, uh, kind of highlight some of the, based on uh, what Richard has mentioned, you know, how our current approach has been and what are some sort of three objectives we're kind of looking at from a development perspective and what challenges we face during that perspective. And you'll get more, and we have a lot of data and a lot of numbers and a lot of maps for you. So I want to kind of get, a, get away from it and kind of walk you through some of the, uh, the challenges of working with national institutions, working with international organizations, and the tremendous diplomatic 
uh, sort of defense, congressional, bipartisan, the entire the US infrastructure that came together to really make this response happen in a very positive way and what we were able to accomplish in the last six months. Uh, to start with, maybe a couple of things on this thing. On the Horn of Africa uh, issue, how different the food security assessment is. First is how quickly do we have the instruments, the tools, uh, the adequate uh, uh, platforms necessary to recognize a food security crisis? Uh, uh, and how quickly and how timely are we in that? And there are a couple of tools that we have available, and you'll talk, you'll meet our FuseNet director, who's also on the open information sharing panel. So we have a whole uh, AID people here today, so I, I don't want to get into the technical aspect of it. So one is uh, our FuseNet capability. Um, second is our conflict assessment. We find that where we see conflict, we also see it as a, a, an issue uh, regarding uh, where the where we see the vulnerabilities in communities taking place. Third is where we see climate change, you know, in terms of rainfall on this. So there are a couple of lenses of how we recognize uh, conflict, uh, the actual drop in food production, <coughs> Sorry. Um, the, the climate issues that we're facing. So we kind of figured out that we do have tools uh, how well these tools are used by host countries, uh, by the international partners and ourselves is something that we're asking ourselves now. Because they, they've taken decades to build these tools up. And I think on this uh, recent um, crisis, we felt like we really, these tools came into play at such an early stage that gave us the opportunity to respond. <coughs> Sorry. The second issue we were dealing with is uh, host country governments. Uh, between Ethiopia, Uganda, uh, Somalia, Kenya, how really different those countries' national platforms and institutions uh, had capabilities because the international response is in support of national response. And so it really uh, gave us the opportunity to say, for example, in, in Ethiopia, who, who's had uh, the country which has had cyclical sort of famine, they have built into their system uh, a sort of a mapping of uh, food high hunger areas, production areas, and so they were able to, uh, and safety nets. So they were, they, Ethiopia had a system of uh, national policies and national response capabilities that was probably more sophisticated than other, the other countries in the region, and were able to mitigate it much quicker. Uh, and we put in about seven, and we spent over a decade building those sa social safety net systems. Whereas in Kenya, uh, they focused on high food production through our Feed the Future system, you know, uh, the presidential initiative, President Obama's initiative on Feed the Future. And we concentrated on where we can get food. And in Kenya, we found a different type of issue about the national policies on pastoralism you know, on northern Kenya. How, do, how does the national government really view the future of pastorals? Uh, you know, do they see it as converting them into uh, urban population? Are they supporting them as farmers or livelihoods? So that in Kenya, it became an issue of what does the government think of pastoral communities? Uh, what is their policies regarding it? And how, how flexible are they in terms of moving that agenda forward? Uh, and in Somalia, as uh, Richard mentioned, sort of there are sort of two Somalias, the Al-Shabaab held uh, Somalia and the non-Al-Shabaab held Somalia. But, and, and we were able to respond into the non-Al-Shabaab quite uh, quickly and quite openly in terms of having partners who work in there. On Al-Shabaab held areas, we had to find ways to get uh, maybe food in there, but also the purchasing power, meaning there were markets in some of those areas that were controlled by Al-Shabaab, but we had to find ways, what financial instruments, what creative financial instruments could we use to get food into the, have increased their purchasing power so they could buy food from local markets. Um, and then in Uganda, uh, in the Karmoja held areas, and uh, how do we help them deal with pastoralism? And now we're facing in South Sudan. And the main, I think the crux of all of this is at the end of the day, uh, both our colleagues at the State Department using the diplomatic channels 
and ourselves using the development uh, colleagues and even our, uh, our colleagues at the Defense Department because Ethiopia uses uh, some of the civil mil, mil teams uh, in, in northern Ethiopia and eastern Ethiopia to really deliver mis net mosquito nets and all of that. So we try to find as many different platforms to say to the host country governments, how do we help you uh, get prepared for the next crisis? We helped you through this crisis but we really want to be able to mitigate, give you the opportunity to build the institutions to mitigate uh, and respond much quicker because we should expect this. That's the other thing I think we, we, we're coming to the conclusion. We should expect these crises um, and, how, and how we built in the infrastructure, both at the international level and at the national level. The other interesting element on this uh, food security crisis on the Horn has been the role of non-DAC non partners, the OEC, non-OECD members, the Turkey, um, the Middle East countries, the OICs, uh, and the African Union itself. For the first time, they really led on a response from the region and from the sub-region uh, and provided uh, leadership and I think they recognize that they need to play sort of a, a greater role in supporting host country governments in the region and that has brought into play a different set of dynamics with our non dac partners because you know we have Busan, we have Paris principles, we have Accra declaration where we in the West sort of have a set of rules on how we deal with humanitarian, de delivery of humanitarian assistance, delivery of um, uh, development assistance and to have new partners uh, who are probably not, uh, you know, have practiced in going from crises to crises, it really took a great engagement strategy and our, our State Department colleagues, you know, were quite instrumental in reaching out to OIC members, the African Union member states, to really advance that, that agenda of we need greater leadership from the region in, in that regard. The third element is the resiliency in communities themselves. Uh, and when we say resiliency, you know, a lot of people uh, kind of separate the type of assistance, humanitarian, transition, stabilization, and development. And for all of us in the development uh, community, it means something. But to the women out in the Dadaab camp or Dolo Auto, it, it's just, it, they don't, their lives don't separate in the types of assistance packages. You know, they just need to get through the day. And one of the things we realized is communities that have the ability to absorb shocks and really take leadership at the local level are able to mitigate uh, uh, the impact of these crises at a greater uh, level than those who don't. And that included local leadership, uh, engagement of women uh, uh, in terms of local conflict uh, prevention and conflict mitigation mechanisms, uh, the ability to use humanitarian and development assistance together to sort of build an economic security base uh, in these communities. And, and as Richard also mentioned, we're hosting a conference uh, in Nairobi at the end of this month to really talk with member states uh, about how will we support their local governments to increase the capacity of communities and institutions to be, uh, build safety nets, to absorb shocks, uh, use, mitigate conflicts at local level, and really um, think through what the economic productive system is uh, to manage uh, such a crisis at the local level. And this is in support of a broader African Union um, um, effort, an EGAD effort, under the CADAP framework, uh, where to increase food production in, in, on the continent. And the biggest challenge is how to take, even if we pr produce food, how to have markets that link from highly pr food productive areas to food deficient areas. And that is part of the economy a lot of these countries are struggling with because they produce food, but the markets and the tools and the financial services and the infrastructure and the transportation to get it to food deficient areas is one of the biggest challenges that these governments are facing. So these are sort of some of the broad challenges. We sort of, uh, we had to take each country for its uh, um, baseline national policies, national institutions and really adjust our tools and our investments and our responses to that capability in the, in, in the region. 
So uh, I'll stop there and um, thank you very much. But I just wanted to kind of give our other colleagues uh, throughout the day the opportunity to delve into some of these uh, issues. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Dory. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the African Affairs Office and Office of the Secretary of Defense. General Ham was mentioning that he's a day away from being one year on the job. I'm getting close to being two months on the job. So just to, to give you a sense of, of how long I've been uh, operating in this portfolio most recently. What I've been doing in the previous five years or so was, was focusing in the strategy arena within, within Office of the Secretary of Defense. So strategic articulations, um, work on futures and, and long-term trends. And so in my remarks, part of what I may bring us a little bit different than what we've talked about so far is, is an appreciation of what, what are some of the, the systemic dimensions when we think about food and food insecurity in the Horn of Africa. Uh, when I first saw the, the topic, one of the first things that popped into my mind and, and will probably date me is, is back to the, the mid-1980s and uh, Michael Jackson and We Are the World and Band-Aid and Do They Know It's Christmas and the, the mobilization by the, the music community and then the popular community at the time to the then famine in Ethiopia uh, and thinking about, you know, that's that's more than 25 years ago now where, where mobilization was happening given the, the food insecurity, dramatic food insecurity at the time in Ethiopia. And we find ourselves here again, um, and we've been in this place before in, in the Horn, but here we are. We're at the end of the, the UN declaration of, of famine for now in, in Somalia, but with a lot of work left to be done, as Raja has articulated so well. United States has been very prominent, as Richard mentioned, in terms of the, the humanitarian response, uh, close to a billion dollars worth of, of food supplies provided um, most recently. So clearly a significant role in responding to, to this crisis yet again. I thought it would be interesting to, to talk about two, two dimensions, um, prevention and then response. These have already come up in, in different ways, but maybe to to add a few additional thoughts. One of the things when we start to think about prevention is assessing the, the underlying trends or, or root causes that bring us to food insecurity on a regular basis in, in a particular geography. Um, and one of the things to, to complement what General Ham was talking about in terms of the, the here and now and the tremendous capabilities that Africa Command uh, brings to the, the region is is another activity that's happening from from the Pentagon and that has to do with the work that is being done to look at long-term trends and in particular I want to highlight an initiative that was started by Secretary Gates a few years back called the Minerva Initiative which is a an effort to um, fund some basic social science research to complement so much funding that, that we do in the the uh, hard sciences, as, as some people like to refer to them. Of course, you have the social scientists who push back and say, we're working in the harder sciences because we're dealing with, with people and, and those types of dynamics. But one of the things that Secretary Gates wanted to do was really prime the pump in terms of really trying to, to better understand what it is that basic social science research can do to, to help us do our jobs better as we look out into the future security environment and attend to some of these, these tremendous challenges with, with better social science insights. One of the projects that has been funded relates directly to the topic today, and this is an activity that's happening at University of Texas, Austin. They have a climate change and African political stability program that's been underway for a couple of years. And if you're not familiar with it, I would, I would <coughs> urge you to, to look at their products. It's all available on the internet, of course. Um, but some of what I would like to, to bring out today is, is derived from, from their insights. And their insights really are intended to, to be um, basic insights that are available to, to policy makers, to operational commanders, um, to, to the general public. One of the, the things when I, when I mentioned climate change, um, one, one thing I think it's worth noting is in terms of the, the current crisis, 
there, there are theories that the current crisis relates to global long-term climate change. The, one of the earlier questions related to the La Nina <coughs> phenomenon and whether East Africa's rains are currently pouring out over, over the Indian Ocean, whether that's part of systemic climate change or not. There, there is not a uh, consensus in the scientific community at this point, but it, but it is something that I think we'll, we'll learn more about going forward. The other is in terms of, of long-term projections um, for Africa and climate change implications. There, there's a significant amount of agreement within the community that North Africa, Northern Africa, will become hotter and, and drier over, over the years, and Southern Africa the same. Picture is, is more variable when it comes to, to East Africa because in part because you have the, the variability of geography there. So the, the assessments there are not as easy to capture in, the, in a bumper sticker, but in general, the, the area that we're talking about now is likely to continue to experience drought, um, perhaps on a more frequent and sustained basis. Other parts of the, the horn and extending into East Africa will get wetter, so it's kind of a mixed picture when, when you look at, at the East African um, arena. But rather than climate change, what I really wanted to, to focus on was, was some of the work that I think is very interesting that they've done looking um, to develop a vulnerability index or a vulnerability methodology, because I think that that kind of um, basic research can, can really support the kinds of experiences that we have as, as a government um, in responding on a regular basis. And one of the things that, that they have done is to, to look at a methodology where, where you look at the exposure of different countries to natural hazards, and you do that on a historical basis. Also looking at population density, then looking at measures of resilience that Raja has, has just mentioned, but there, there are measurable indicators to focus on there. And lastly, levels of, of governance and violence that, that you can track, again, historically. And when you put the different indicators together, you can weight them in different ways. <coughs> Excuse me, but if, if you weight each of those baskets evenly and, and look at the African continent, um, when you're looking at East Africa, the, the two places that come to the top of the list as the most vulnerable are Somalia, Southern Somalia in particular, and South Sudan. Um, that there's certainly an intuitive understanding there when you think about the very limited levels of governance and resilience in those societies at, at this point. It kind of makes sense independent of whatever the, the underlying methodology is. Um, but it's also true of parts of Ethiopia and Eritrea. And then when you look into the broader region, Burundi and DRC also have significant vulnerability. So when, when you think about vulnerability, you think about the, the cycles of food insecurity and, and conflict that go back historically in the region. What do we see when we look forward? What are, what are some of the underlying trends? Um, a few of those jump out at me. When you look at demographic trends on the continent and, and you understand that Africa's population is projected to, to double from here to 2050, um, the, the challenges that we experience today uh, are only likely to intensify when you think about the, the additional um, numbers of, of people involved. A second trend is urbanization, um, it, as we see the, the inflow of uh, people looking for economic opportunities in, in cities or escaping conflict or escaping the, the impacts of, of natural disasters. That urbanization trend is, is a very important one. The climate, underlying climate trends I've touched on already, they, they're um, it, murky. We're improving our understanding um, with each, each passing year, but I think you could say we can expect to experience additional challenges in, in the Horn of Africa, um, especially the, the intensity and the frequency of severe weather events, which is something that is, is well established at this point. And then the, the kind of fourth underlying basket of trends that I see are, are the ones that really vary so tremendously. The, these are the ones that relate to, to security and to governance. And this is really where the people dimension and, and the social sciences begin to, to impact and it may be our greatest leverage points when you think about what, what it is that, that we can change, what it is that others in, in the region and partners can change 
um, you know, tackling climate change as we know is, is a kind of global challenge. Um, tackling demographics is, is something that is, is most experienced locally, but trying to, to have effects on the way conflicts are unfolding or the way that governance is pro progressing is something that's very much in, in our lane, in my view. Um, thinking about responses, kind of moving from the diagnostic or the, the preventive side of things, what, what can we do about root causes and some of the, the underlying trends to, to try to address this continuous cycle that we have seen of food insecurity and, and conflict? I like very much the, the premise that Amartya Sen has when he talks about famine as a, a political phenomenon. And I was drawn to one of his quotes where he talked about a free press and an active political opposition constitute the best early warning system a country threatened by famines can have. So I think that really ties back into a lot of what Richard was saying in terms of the, the work that is done um, primarily with the State Department, but as General Hamm has highlighted, the Department of Defense has an important supporting role to play in our mill-to-mill -mill engagements, but how it is that, that we're working on, on the government's, governance dimension uh, General Ham referred to the, the logistics capacity the Department of Defense has. That's one of the things that typically comes into play when, when you're facing a, an urgent crisis. Um, we are we are uh, we benefit from the fact that there's such experience in international organizations, the World Food Program, and the whole UN family, all of the NGO community when it comes to responding to to crises. Thank you. DOD can bring some, some unique capabilities t to bear at times when the civilian capacity is exhausted, for example, or at times where, where there are contested or non-permissive environments. That, that's really where DOD has a, has a particular niche role to, uh, to play. General Ham mentioned the, the famous 3Ds approach, you know, the, the diplomacy, the development, the defense. I think we're in you know, or order here on, on the 3Ds today. Those are key components to building partner capacity and to conflict resolution. He described a, a few vignettes of, of things that the Department of Defense or Africa Command has, has engaged in. I would just add a couple more to, to the list. Um, I'd like to mention the Africa Center for Security Studies, and we have the, the director here today in the front row in the form of Ambassador Bellamy. But this is, this is something that is, is sponsored by Department of Defense. It's a regional center that brings together um, African participants for purposes of dialogue, discussion, education at all different levels. And this fall, most, most recently, they engaged a very senior level audience from 20 odd African countries talking about climate change and water security food security, some of these longer term challenges. And going back to General Ham's comments that sometimes these types of dialogues with, with an audience that wouldn't necessarily think that climate or energy or food or water are really central to, to their day-to-day -day operations, that kind of exposure has, has longer term dividends that we, we think are important to maintain. Another, another program that I think is worthwhile highlighting is the Department of Defense's state partnership program that uses uh, National Guard uh, groups who will engage in partnership with African militaries. And many of the, the Guardsmen are bringing to bear their, their civilian expertise, and that can usually include engineering, it can include agriculture, it can include law enforcement, a whole variety of disciplines. But in those countries where we engage with our state partnership program through the National Guard, we've experienced some, some interesting success. It's a, it's a program, like many, that you wish you could scale up in a very significant way, but, but obviously resource constraints prevent that on a continental scale, but we, we, we are doing our best to leverage the, the results and the resources that we do have. Um, just to, to briefly echo Richard's mention about AMISOM and the important role that the, the region is playing at this point and the international community uh, in support. I think we are at, at a, a potential turning point in terms of the, the galvanizing effects to, to what has been a very difficult situation for decades now. Um, if you can be a glass half full person, a glass half empty person, I choose to be a glass half full 
but I think there's a, a lot of work ahead um, in the region for the United States, for the other international partners to, to support. Um, so I just, I thank NDU and, and Len in closing for, for bringing this subject to, to our attention and giving this community a chance to, to meet and dialogue today. I would just quote President Obama in closing. He, he said that aid is not an end in itself, and I think that's really what this discussion is about today. How do you get out of the humanitarian assistance emergency aid cycle and into something that, that has more, more sustainability and more of a, a longer-term prospect for success? Thank you. I'm a great believer in trying to devote as much time as possible to Q&A, so I'm going to be unnecessarily brief so we have a little bit of time left. But I'll make just three points. Uh, first, I want to return to a theme that uh, Admiral Rondo began with, that food is a weapon. And indeed, if you look at the Horn of Africa, there are instances where food has been a weapon. It's not usually a weapon, I should point out, but it can be and has been. Uh, the three cases that I would cite uh, one already mentioned, uh, although not in the same context, uh, by Amanda, was the horrific famine in Ethiopia in the mid-1980s, uh, a famine which I would argue was actually much worse than the one that we just went through in the Horn of Africa. And during that famine, the Derg government, a very left-leaning government at the time, made every effort to withhold any food going into Tigrayan areas of Ethiopia because they were rebels fighting against the government. Clearly, food was a weapon there. Another instance was Somalia in 1992, 1993, during the Operation Restore Hope period. Perhaps a few of you in this room were involved with Operation Restore Hope. In this case, it was Somali warlords who were basically stealing food uh, from NGOs and from international organizations and using it for their own military purposes. And most recently, also in Somalia, the case mentioned by uh, Richard Roth. Uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia today. All examples of food as a weapon in the Horn of Africa. My second point uh, is that you have in, in, in the Horn of Africa, and I define the Horn of Africa as essentially the EGAD country, so I include Uganda and Kenya in it, essentially structural food deficits that now go back uh, a fair number of decades. Now it's not true in all of the countries, Uganda and Kenya are somewhat more blessed than the rest of the Horn. But you take Ethiopia, for example. Ethiopia has essentially had a structural food deficit since the waning years of Haile Selassie in the early 1970s. So that essentially, almost, well, in fact, every year, they have not been able to grow enough food to feed their people. On average, in a relatively normal crop year, they need to import food to feed between uh, three and four million people. That's a normal year. You have a bad crop year, and that number rises significantly. Now, that's every year since uh, the early 1970s. And when you have a growing population uh, at the same time going on in, in Ethiopia and throughout the Horn, for that matter, you simply exacerbate the problem every year. Uh, Raja did point out, for example, that Ethiopia, at least, is one of the countries that is, is doing very well in terms of managing the problem. So in the recent uh, food crisis in, in the Horn of Africa, you had no famine in Ethiopia. You had food shortages, you had severe food shortages, but you had no famine. You only had famine in parts of, um, of um, Somalia. Uh, South Sudan, this may be the new area to watch. Um, it was just alluded to by, by Amanda. The estimate is, according to the World Food Program, that you will have 4.7 million people who are food insecure in 2012 alone. And of that 4.7 million, 1 million will be severely food insecure. So you may have South Sudan being, in effect, the new Somalia for 2012. Oh, Sudan, on the northern part of Sudan. Sudan used to be considered the breadbasket of the Horn of Africa. It was considered to be the area that could grow enough food to feed the entire region. What happened? They discovered oil. They discovered oil and decided, my goodness, it's a lot easier to make money selling oil than it is to grow food. That's hard work. They let their agricultural, the, the whole agricultural component of the economy deteriorate, and today you find Sudan often importing food, and they have not uh, gotten to the point of resurrecting their agricultural base. Uh, 
Somalia, at least since it became a failed state in 1991, has been every single year a food importing country and usually significantly so. So you have some really serious structural food problems in the Horn of Africa and they're only going to get worse uh, because you have a growing population in all of those countries. Uh, my third and final comment is on a cautionary note. In terms of dealing with early projections about uh, food insecurity, famine, uh, numbers of people who will be affected, numbers, numbers of potential deaths, my experience in going back to the, the early 1960s and dealing with the horn is these projections are rarely right. Uh, they're either grossly overstated or grossly understated. And you never quite know which one it's going to be, unfortunately. But let's take just the recent case of the, of the most recent Horn of Africa food security crisis. Um, the, one of the projections was that there would be up to 750,000 deaths as a result of the food insecurity problems throughout the Horn, particularly in Somalia. Now, technically, I have no problem with that figure. It's technically right. Uh, technically, you could say up to 50 million, I suppose, the entire population of, of, the, of the entire region. But the point is that one needs to be careful about throwing these statistics around. Uh, I don't know for sure what has actually transpired in the Horn of Africa as a result of, uh, of the most recent famine. The economist uh, that came out two weeks ago used a figure of 80,000 deaths in the Horn. Now, that's a lot. And that's 80,000 too many, don't misunderstand me. But it's not 750,000. So it's important to, to try to be a little, a little more careful in throwing these figures around. Now, human nature gets into this. Uh, international organizations who are in the business of um, raising money to, um, to buy more food for their stocks, non-governmental organizations who are in the business of distributing the food, keeping people employed. And I like to tend to jack the numbers up because that gets people's attention. And I can understand the reason for doing that, but I just want this audience to know that you need to be careful about accepting at face value any of these figures that are mentioned. That still gives us, by my count, 12 minutes for Q&A, so I'm going to stop right there. Thank you.